TVC matchups are heating up. And if you can't take the heat, get out of the kitchen. We saw two heavyweight matchups between Megs and Vinton County. Plus, we saw an overtime thriller between the state-ranked Triple Tomcats and the Burn Union Rockets. And on this week's Beyond the Court, a federal hogging senior that makes playing with one eye look easy. You don't want to miss episode three of Hardwood Heroes. It starts right now. a few weeks away from the start of the state tournament and the battle for to take home the conference championship is getting more intense by the minute. We start our show on a high note from Plains with Athens lead reporter Chloe G. Workman to talk about the Lady Bulldogs exciting week. Jack, we saw a nail biter that ultimately ended with the Bulldogs on top. After some snow cancellations earlier in the week, we finally got to see the Athens girls basketball team as River Valley made a trip to the Plains. It was a back and forth affair as the two teams stayed within just a couple points the whole contest. Flash forward, Bailey Davis hits a three-pointer that ultimately holds on to the Bulldogs' lead. The Raiders don't go down without a fight though as it was just 0.7 seconds left. River Valley down by one with the perfect chance to score but that Bulldog defense locked down and kept them from getting a shot up, ultimately taking this game by just one point. Now Chloe, just how significant was this Bulldogs win? Well, Jack, this was the fourth conference win of the season for the squad. This is the first time the Lady Bulldogs have picked up a four conference wins in a single season in six years. This also was their second win against River Valley, a team they split with last week. For senior Kiana Benton, this, was just fun. this one just felt more special. Uh, really good, especially because last year we split with them. So, like, that was one of my goals to win against the teams we sw split with last year. Now switching to a not so high note, Chloe, how did the boys game play out? The boys team started on a high point, but they slowly lost their momentum. The Bulldogs came out fierce out of the gate, toppling the Vikings 12 to five after the first quarter. Levi Neal picked up a pair of threes and the team seemed unstoppable. The momentum seemed to shift after the half as the Vikings came out hungry. Neal also was suffering a tailbone injury and this seemed to alter the Bulldog performance as a whole. Entering the fourth quarter, the hope seemed to leave the Bulldogs' eyes and it reflected its way onto the court. Now what other differences between last week to this week did you see? Last week, the Bulldogs relied heavily on their points in the paint, while this week seemed to be a bit of a mis mismatch. The Vinton County duo Ashton Allman and Asa Davidson seemed to be unstoppable under the glass. Similarity though is the Bulldogs still struggled beyond the arc, shooting only 3 for 22. The Vikings had locked in defense. The Bulldogs just couldn't get anything done, especially after the injury taking out Neal. As the season winds down, these conference games are becoming much more important. Yeah, you're absolutely right, Chloe. It'll be interesting to see how the boys can play spoiler against Megs in Nelsonville, York. And you can stay up to date on the Bulldogs playing spoiler and all the other teams throughout the TVC by following along to all our social media platforms. Check out all our game recaps and post-game analysis on Twitter and Facebook and catch the best plays and best snapshots on our Instagram. And now you can even see an extra level to each team in the TVC when you check out our new TikTok. Now staying in the TVC Ohio, the Nelsonville York Buckeyes have proven their talent but continue to struggle with injuries. For more insight, Cade Williamson joins us now. Thanks, Jack. The Nelsonville York boys have had a tough season so far as they have yet to play a game at full strength. I caught up with Coach Gabriel this week and talked with him about the limited numbers for the Buckeyes. It's been tough. I mean, we played uh, three or four games this year with just five. Uh, you saw tonight we have six. So, you know, my kids, we're conditioned that we can play this way. The kids give me 110%. So, uh, but we'll be ready. I mean, these kids are, they haven't given up. They're ready to play. Uh, you saw that here tonight. And it sounds like health has been a major issue with the team. How did that impact them this week? Well, Jack, the Buckeyes seem to be ready to roll when they took on the Megs Marauders. It was popping in Pomeroy for this one, and the Megs home crowd was a factor. The Marauders had a hot start, but Nelsonville York worked back in the game with the help of Drew Carter. Carter drilled this cold three right here and gave a little smirk to the student section. The Buckeyes went into the half down 37-32, and they tried to get things going. NY came out of the half on a mission as Keegan Swope and James Koskich contributed some threes of their own. The Buckeyes were only down two heading into the fourth and eventually took the lead. 
Nelsonville York and Megs went shot for shot down the stretch, but Coulter Cleveland secured the victory for the Marauders with this steal converting both free throws after being fouled. Megs took the victory. So did the, the boys had a tough loss in what looked like a potential trap game. How did the girls do this week? Well, Jack, the NY girls had a great week as they traveled to Wellston to take on the Rockets. It was a great night for the Buckeyes as they got off to a slow start, though, heading into the half down 28-21. However, Mackenzie Hurd was the word tonight as she dropped 22 points, got seven boards, and dished out nine assists for the Nelsonville York Buckeyes. The Buckeyes quieted the Wellston crowd as their shooting was efficient as they shot an otherworldly 70.3% from the field in the second half. And look at this dime right here from her to Era Levy. Easy bucket, Buckeyes. Levy held the three-point crown tonight, scoring 18 of her 22 points from behind the arc. What a night. After that performance, Jack, I think Levy and especially Mackenzie Hurd should be considered for Hero of the Week. The Buckeyes pulled out the victory 73-31, keeping their TVHC hopes alive. For NY to win a share of the TBC Ohio, they need some help. They need to win out first, and Alexander needs to lose to either Megs or VC. Benton County needs to lose two of their last three games as they face Athens, Alexander, and River Valley. The Nelsonville York team needs to win the TBC Ohio outright. They need Alexander and Benton County to lose out and win out in the process. While the Buckeyes still have a chance to win the conference, there are a lot of moving pieces in their way. Yeah, Cade, you mentioned it, and Alexander is one of those pieces. And now to take us through what the Spartans need to happen in order to come out as conference champions, we welcome reporter Shane Scalfaro. Well, Jack, the conference championship is in reach for the Spartans girls. With three big games ahead, including one against former champs Vinton County, their fate is in their own hands. If Alexander wins out, they are conference champs. If they lose to Vinton County or any of their last three games, they'll, lose, or they'll need VC to lose two of their last three, which requires VC getting upset by either Athens or River Valley. Vinton County beat Alexander the first time around, so if Alexander wants the tiebreaker, they need to beat VC this Thursday. We spoke to Coach Grinstead about how this girls team can improve en route to a conference crown. We just got to continue with the, with the little things. I mean, we got to go for every rebound. We got to box out. We got to take care of the basketball. You know, taking care of the basketball is so important to this team. And we got to take advantage of our opportunities when we get them around the basket. So how did the Spartan girls do with the TVC Ohio lead on the line? Jack, this team put on a show in front of their home crowd to keep their TVC lead intact. Senior night in Alexander only meant one thing, dominating in front of their home crowd. Their opponent, Wilston, had no chance against the defensive juggernaut they were about to face. The Spartans smothered the Golden Rockets, allowing them to nine points in the first half. They also had six steals on the night, thanks to Marley Grinstead's lockdown defense. On the offensive side of the ball, seniors Marley Grinstead, Kara Meeks, and Olivia Ohms had themselves a night with 16 points each, with Grinstead leading the way with 16 points, three rebounds, seven assists, and three steals. With stats like that, Grinstead has a good case for Hero of the Week. The Spartans girls keep their momentum rolling and extend their win streak to five. And now let's switch it over to the Spartans boys. How did their week go? Well, the team got to flex their might and make a push towards the top of the standings with a dominating win over Nelsonville York. It was a complete turnaround from last week for the Spartans. With Alexander controlling both sides of the ball, Nelsonville York had no answers to stop this high-powered team. Led by Kyla D'Augustino, this team effectively found the Buckeyes' weaknesses on defense and exploited them. With 76 total points and shooting a total of 67% from the field, they dominated on the offensive side of the ball. In terms of defense, the Spartans had 12 steals and held the Buckeyes star Drew Carter to just 14 points. There was no stopping the Spartans, and this trend could easily continue in these final games. We talked to Coach Skinner about how this team gets better moving forward. We're just trying to get better every game. I know that's all cliche, and I hate sports cliches, uh, but we're just trying to get better every game. The other guys are getting better, and, and that's the key. Both Spartans teams should absolutely be in consideration for frontrunners in the TBC Ohio. Sounds like the arrow is pointing up for Alexander. Thanks for the great work, Shane. And this win came as no surprise to our fans as 76% of you picked the Spartans to devour the Buckeyes. Think you know who's winning next week's games? Hurry over to our Instagram right now to pick your winners. Now later in the week, we saw two battles for the top of the TBC Ohio, but in both games, fans gave a slight edge to the Vikings over the Marauders. Now to give us the full story on both of these matchups, we welcome Benton County reporter Tyler Stevens and Meg's lead reporter Aiden Crowley to the show. Jack, these two games had a lot on the line. For the boys, it was a clash between the top teams in the TVC Ohio. 
Yeah, Aiden. And for the girls, Megs was on the outside looking in. With the win, they put themselves right in the race for a title. But it was Vinton County who came out firing on all cylinders. Lacey Williams started the three-point barrage for the Vikings, and it didn't stop there. Cameron Zinn and a host of Vikings poured it on during the first quarter as Vinton County jumped out to an early 23-8 lead. But Megs would not go away. The pesky marauders were relentless on defense, forcing turnovers and clawing back into this one. Megs battled to go into the locker room trailing by just three. It was a back and forth third quarter as Vinton County maintained a two point lead going into the fourth. Tegan Barta would find fire, going off for 10 points in the final quarter and finishing the game with 20. But the biggest moment for Barto came on the other end. With 15 seconds on the clock, she swats Delana Wright as the Vikings escape in a thriller 60 to 54. Wow, it sounds like we had an instant classic with the girls. Now take us through the boys game. Well, Jack, the stakes were just as big and the two teams did not disappoint. Just like the girls, it was the Vikings who came out hot. Uh, Braylon Dameron was the guy for BC, knocking down back-to-back -back threes to fire the Vikings up early. Then it's Megs' turn. Braden Harrison swats Eli Radaball, gathers the loose ball, and takes this one coast to coast. He hits a dirty Euro for the and one. 13-12 BC at the end of one. But it was all Vikings in the second. Dameron keeps the hot hand as he gets the defender off his feet, sidesteps, and bangs another three. The Vikings shot the lights out in the first half and took a 31-19 lead into the locker room. Just when it looked like VC was pulling away, Megs turned up on the defensive end. Coulter Cleland rips it from Radabaugh and drops a dime to Chase Garcia. The Marauders cut the lead to just four in the third. With the game on the line, who else but Dameron? Four-point play dagger as VC comes out on top, 61-50. Tyler, you could tell these two teams did their homework coming into this matchup. You're absolutely right, Aiden. Both teams had a well-prepared game plan. For Megs, they came into this game understanding that they were undersized. Because of this, they showed a 2-3 zone. But Tyler, VC was able to exploit this. Yeah, you're right, Aiden. VC used a combination of pace and passing to carve up the zone. The Vikings were relentless with each Marauder misstep. They pushed the tempo and picked up easy points with the scrambling Megs defense that can never get set. BC capitalized the miscommunication by finding the open man with quick ball movement. On the other end, Megs was faced with the exact same challenge. However, the Marauders made things easy on the Vikings' defense. Instead of forcing, de de excuse me, forcing defenders to make decisions, Megs did exactly what VC wanted them to, settle for threes. The Vikings had that covered, as the Marauders shot just three for 23 from deep. Like here, the Marauders have three guards on the perimeter and make no effort getting downhill. With the shooting struggles, the Marauders needed a spark. This came with a 2-2-1 press. Throughout the third, the Vikings played right into the Marauders' trap. Instead of attacking the most vulnerable spot, the center, they settled for the sidelines. This sped VC up and forced them into poor decision making. Yeah, at the final break, we saw the Vikings slow down to beat the press. They found their way into the back lines of the defense to set themselves up for three on two situations. The Vikings feasted on the advantages they created, allowing them to pull away to take sole possession of the TVC Ohio. And for Megs, while the girls are mathematically eliminated from a conference title, the boys are still very much alive. Well, we'll have to pay extra close attention to this race as it nears tournament time. Thanks for the great work, guys. Now that we've broken down the matchups out of the Ohio, let's check out the standings. First, in the boys, Vinton County still holds that one spot, while Alexander jumped Megs to go up to two and dropped the Marauders to three. Wellston still holds the four spot with Athens hanging on to five. River Valley and Nelsonville, York wrap up the standings at 6 and 7. Turning the page over to the girls' side, the girls of the TVC Ohio saw no changes in their standings. Alexander still holds the one spot with the second place Vinton County looking to jump them. Nelsonville, York finds themselves at third, while Megs remains at four. Athens holds that fifth spot, while River Valley and Wilson wrap things up at 6 and 7. Now, before we start talking about the games of the TVC Hawking, one of those squads is our third stop on our journey beyond the court. We now welcome the host of Beyond the Court, Curtis Fader. Curtis, now we've been to Reedsville and we made a stop at Athens, but where does our trip take us this week? Thanks, Jack. Now this week, our journey beyond the court lands us in Stewart, where one special player for the Federal Hawking Lancers does not let his unique disadvantage stop him from making his mark on the floor. Lane Smith is a senior forward for the Federal Hawking Lancers. He had grown up with a basketball in his hand, but in his eighth grade year, a devastating setback occurred. I got shot with a BB gun. And really? the, yeah, and the BB, the BB went through my eye and then up into my brain. It was, it was point blank, so I, I lost all complete vision in that eye. And 
In addition to blind spots on the defensive end, an adjustment had to be made when performing a jump shot due to the disappearance of his depth perception. Now to demonstrate the importance of depth perception, I'm going to be doing a little experiment myself. I'm going to be doing a set of shots with both of my eyes, and then I'm going to do a set of shots with just one of my eyes available. Well, let's see how it goes. Unlike me, Smith trained his shot to the point where he is a dangerous scoring threat anywhere on the court, making him one of the key factors to Fedhawk's success. Coach Thompson is relying on his leadership to put the team over the top. He's been the leader of the team since day one of summer league or anything. I mean, he's, he tries to push the guys. He does it the right way. I told him at the beginning of the year, you're going to have to be my leader now. You're a senior. You've been in this program for four years. You know what we expect. I want you to be a leader, not a boss. After posting an impressive 20.12 rebound double-double in their recent game against South Gallia, the sky's the limit for Smith and the Lancers with one eye or two. When asked about his season's aspirations, Lane Smith said that he wanted to win sectionals and retake the TVC Hawking that Trimble took from them last year. And with the way that he and the Lancers have been playing, I wouldn't be surprised if Lane gets to cut down some nets before his high school career comes to an end. Now let's head back over to the desk with Jack to learn more about what Federal Hawking's doing on the court. Thanks, Curtis. We now welcome Federal Hawking reporter Maria Manessi. Now, Maria, how did the Lancers build off of last week's momentous win? Well, Jack, the Federal Hawking girls tried to prove that things were turning around for them, but all hopes fell short in their 61-27 loss. From the beginning, things weren't looking good for Federal Hawking. South Gallia held a first quarter lead that kept growing and was hard to come back from. The Lancers had no response defensively to slow down the Rebels' offense. Federal Hawking simply got outplayed in the matchup. Everything from missed opportunities to getting in the paint to turnovers, nothing seemed to go right for the Lancers. And now you say nothing went right, but what stood out as their biggest issue? The biggest issue for the Lancers was not being able to keep up with the energy the Rebels brought. As time went on, there were multiple made three-pointers from South Gallia, which caused their lead to climb, and Federal Hawking could simply not keep up. The Lancers struggled to find ways to score, which seemed to impact the team's morale. And now let's transition over to the boys. How did their week turn out? The boys are on a roll, and their success against South Gallia proved that they are able to get things done in crucial moments. Coming into the game against South Gallia, Federal Hawking looked to continue their win streak, and they did just that. But the end result didn't come without a fight. The Rebels gave the Lancers a back-and-forth contest when things heated up in the third quarter. A timeout taken by Federal Hawking helped them to regroup and go on a 29-19 run to seal the deal. And now we've heard this name early in the show. How is Lane Smith able to contribute to the Lancers' success? Lane Smith has been a dominant player as of late and didn't hold back against South Gallia. He had 20 points and 12 rebounds and was all over the court, making moves on both the offensive and defensive side of the ball. And I can't go without seeing this dunk one more time. Smith and the Lancers are now winners of the last nine as they took this one over the Rebels 74-64. Although the boys may be cruising along, the road ahead certainly won't be easy at times, but the Lancers know what still needs improvement and what they can work on moving forward. Just, but mainly just trying to do it day by day. Like I said, I mean, we've, we've got to get better in so many parts of the game. Um, each and every night against every team. Uh, I think our defense is, our defense needs to get better and our rebounding. Uh, mainly just trying to work on our defense, of course. And even offensively, we got to be able to run through plays, make sure that we're fluent with the plays. Mainly just run through offenses, trying to get them to run through. Um, Trimble is a good team, as you guys know, undefeated. So we practice, we go the game plan, film just about everything in practice that we can possibly do to game time. And the team that lies ahead of them, the Trimble Tomcats. We're now joined by Trimble reporter Haley Hollinger to break down the Tomcats' domination. Jack, 
dominate they did, all thanks to the determination and discipline of Coach Howie Codwell and his players, specifically Blake Guffey. Guffey was not only Trimble's top scorer, but the top scorer of the game, with 29 points on his own. To contribute to this impressive performance, he had 12 rebounds, 8 assists, and 6 steals. The Tomcat senior shot 67% from the field and 80% from the line, but their success is also attributed to their coach. Trimble head coach Howie Codwell was inducted into the Eastern Eagle Hall of Fame before their matchup took place on the 28th. While he was with the Eagles, he had a team make it to the Final Four, and those men joined him on the floor. It is clear for anyone in the stands, on the court, or elsewhere, that Codwell wants to get back there. But while he wants to win, he also wants to build character. And so what does a coach do to build that character? This is seen in instances like coaches' halftime talks. While we may not get to hear them, we see their results. And the Tomcats came out playing a completely different game of basketball after their time in the locker room. We saw Howie's influence again when the boys came out eager to take on South Gallia after their end of game chat. And now it's no secret the boys are dominating, but the girls had their last, their first loss last weekend. How did they bounce back? Jack, the Triple Lady Tomcats blasted the Rockets in their 15th win of the season. Here's how it went. The game began with an 8-0 lead for the Tomcats, which would be the biggest lead of the night, as both teams would take turns scoring from that point forward. But the lead would remain with Trimble until the Rockets' top dog, Sophia Klein, hit a buzzer beater three to finish out the half. The Tomcats, barely behind Byrne for the majority of the third, made big plays to regain the lead once more. And of course, this would not fly for the Rockets, and they, more like Sophia Klein, made huge moves to keep it close. Now, I heard one of the Trimble players reached a huge career milestone during that game. You heard correctly. Senior Emily Klein hit her 1,000th point during the third quarter, and she has started since her freshman year and never missed a practice, which explains why she, along with Jane Six, was a top scorer in this contest. Six and Young had 24 combined points, and with that being said, one of the most important shots of the game was hit by Jaylee Osborne, securing the win in overtime with a final score of 47 to 42. And those Tomcats will be matched up with one of the top teams in the TVC Ohio in the Alexander Spartans. It'll be interesting to see how they match up next week. Thanks for the great work, Haley. And now you can catch all the action shots from the Trimble game on our Facebook page. We've got all the best picks from all around the conference. All you got to do is head over to a Facebook and give us a follow. Whether it's on the court, on the bench, or in the lockers, we've got you covered. Every spot, every shot for every team including the team we're about to talk about next, the Eastern Eagles. And to tell us more about the story behind those photos, Eastern reporter Dylan Westmeyer joins us to talk about what went down. Well, Jack, the boys are coming off a loss against Waterford last Friday night. The Eagles traveled to Crown City in hopes of dethroning the South Galley Rebels and securing their second win of the season. The Eagles started out cold but turned it on after Trey Hill hit a massive three. This carried the Eagles to an 11-10 lead at the end of the first. They held the lead midway through the second when South Gallia's Gabe Frazee retook the lead off a steal and lay in. The Rebels went into half up 25-18 and never looked back. And so Dylan, you mentioned the Eagles did see a lead in the game early on. What led to their eventual downfall? Two words, Jack, free throws. Eastern struggled from the line, shooting eight for 23, leaving 15 freebies on the floor. The rebound battle was also not kind to Eastern as they were out rebounded 28 to 20. These have been reoccurring themes for the Eagles throughout the season. And so we talked about the Eagles' shortcomings, but tell me, was there anything positive that Eastern can take away from this game? Eastern had the game's top scorer in Trey Hill, who had 21 while going 3 for 5 from deep. Hill has become a certified scorer for the Eagles. While Hill did have a breakout performance, it wasn't enough as South Gallia won 51 to 42. Okay, now we talked about the guys' issues this week. Let's jump over to the girls. I heard they had an off week. That's right, Jack. They were scheduled to play Trimble on Monday, but the game was postponed. They also picked up a tough out-of-conference matchup against Jackson that was canceled on Thursday. Okay, so now what lies ahead for the Eastern Eagles? The Lady Eagles have a jam-packed final stretch of the season, playing five games in eight days to end the regular season. Four of those games being in-conference matchups against the top two and bottom two teams of the conference. They also have a tough out-of-conference matchup against Burn Union, who was previously ranked ninth in the state until their loss against Trimble. What do the Eagles need to do in order to end this regular season on a high note? Well, Jack, it starts with their dynamic duo of Sidney Reynolds and Erica Durst. Over the past two games, Durst and Reynolds have been tearing it up. Durst had a combined 31 points, while Reynolds had a combined 40. These two combined for 71 of the team's 94, which is a whopping 75.5%. 
They've also dominated on the glass, clearing a combined 33 rebounds, 17 and 16 respectively. Jack, this accounts for 60% of the team's total rebounds. And with how tough their end of the year schedule is, the Eagles will need to be at the top of their game all throughout in order to finish this season strong. Yeah, Jack, it'll be interesting to see how the Eagles fa fare, especially against the top of their conference. Thanks for the great work, Dylan. And now, that, now let's take a look at the standings in the Hawking. The boys saw no changes as undefeated Trimble hangs in the number one spot with their absolute domination and Federal Hawking right behind them at the number two. Waterford and South Gallia, they currently sit at three and four. Bell Prix currently holds that five spot. And now finally, Eastern and Southern still finish out the last two spots of the standings at six and seven. And now similar to the girls in the TVC Ohio, the standings in the TVC Hawking, the girls did not change. The domination of Trimble Tomcats hold the one spot, so they sweep the one spot. But they will be faced with their biggest challenge against the number two Waterford Wildcats next week. South Gallia sits third with Eastern at fourth. And finally, Bell Pre, Federal Hawking, and Southern round out the last three spots in the standings. Now we've seen some great games this week, but it's time for the moment you've all been waiting for. It's time to announce our picks for Heroes of the Week. We bring Curtis back to the show to announce his pick for Boys Hero of the Week. Thanks, Jack. Now, we've heard this name all over the place on the court, but this week it is Kyler Diagostino, of course. Diagostino has been known to be the centerpiece for the Spartan squad, and this week was no different. Against Nelsonville York, he shot 14 for 20 from the field on a 70% clip, totaling a game-high 32 points. The junior guard has been putting up astronomical numbers all year and has been an explosive force pushing Alexander into TVC Ohio contention. While Diagostino is an elite scorer, he is also an exceptional facilitator, with him being unafraid to share the wealth and get his teams involved. Diagostino filled up that stat sheet against the Buckeyes by nearly recording a triple-double with 32 points, 10 rebounds, 9 assists, oh, and 6 deals to go along with it. Numbers like these are what the definition of what it means to be heroic. Now, Jack, we have revealed our boys' Hero of the Week, and there's a lot of campaigning on who should be the girls' Hero of the Week, so who has the honor? Oh, Curtis, do you not know? Have you not heard? Our Girls' Hero of the Week comes directly out of Nelsonville, York, and it is none other than Mackenzie Hurd. In Thursday's game against the Wilson Golden Rockets, Hurd was a force to be reckoned with offensively. She led the way, being one of the game's leading scorers, dropping 22 points and scoring 80% from the field in the second half. That includes 100% from beyond the arc. She was also close to getting a double-double as she utilized great court vision and tallied a total of nine assists. Hurd was an offensive work of art, but it was not just the offensive side where she prospered. Along with Hurd's 22 points and nine assists, Hurd pulled in seven boards and was a thief in the night as she totaled six steals. We were a few key plays away from a possible quadruple double. Hurd has consistently proven herself to be a focal point for these Nelsonville York Buckeyes, and she proved it against the Golden Rockets. And now, Curtis, it's been another great week of performances, and both players were a few key plays away from doing something we have not yet seen before. A, a quadruple double is incredible, and keep in mind, we had a huge competition. I mean, we had Guffey, Cleland, and we had several people saying that they wanted their Heroes of the Week, but maybe their time will come next week, and we'll have to find out, because we still have five weeks left of the show. Yeah, you're absolutely right, Curtis. We have seen some great players already, but we have a lot left in store. So that's all the time we have for you guys tonight. Be sure to stay tuned to all our social media platforms, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and now catch us on TikTok. From all of us at Harvard Heroes, we're reminding you to be heroic.